for me, it got pretty bad because I would be driving to school and in driving to school, I would have a panic attack in behind the wheel. My, my mind starts going and I would have a panic attack. I, there were so many times when I had to find a place to pull over and just let it play out. And for me personally, I know people, it manifests for people in different ways, but for me personally, it, it happens and it's like I get hit in the chest and then I'm done for the rest of the day. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Bandwagon Podcast for the week of March 18th, 2024. On this edition of the program, news and notes from around the band world, including the sonic boom of the South is at it again. The University of Connecticut launches a pep band outreach project, a tribute to a departed friend and colleague, your band related internet rabbit hole of the week and a conversation that I think you'll find very meaningful, whether you're an educator or not. I'm your host, Rob Hammerton. Hello, dear listener. For this episode of the podcast, well, strap in, it's a ride. A couple of pretty cool college band announcements, a brief story from my ancient blog, and an interview that, well, isn't all fun and games which is not to suggest that my guest and I get into an argument. This is not that kind of podcast. If you're into yelling and screaming, I've got some sports talk radio stations to offer you. But our conversation went into territory that you may not have seen coming based on how I pitched the podcast to you in the first week. It's pretty serious. It's a little bit intense, but that's okay. So restring your French horn valves and away we go. Let's play the first strain. In this episode's first strain, news and notes from the band world. Dateline, Jackson, Mississippi. The sonic boom of the South, which made a surprise appearance at this year's Super Bowl halftime show, is being heard again this spring in stadiums across North America as alumni of Jackson State University's signature marching band tour with rap superstars Drake and J. Cole. The latest leg of the It's All a Blur, Big as the What tour began February 2nd, accompanied by a 24-member ensemble made up of sonic boom alumni. Christopher C.J. Gibson is Drake's road manager and is a former Sonic Boom snare drummer who graduated from JSU in 2007. He said that the idea to include a marching band arose from Drake's vision to create a sports-themed show. During the planning stages of the tour, Gibson insisted the band should be from a historically black college or university. Gibson told Black Enterprise magazine, quote, They know I played the marching band during my college years, so they reached out to me and asked me if I could help put this thing together. To me, it was important that I got an HPCU, but specifically, it had to be my alma mater. Gibson linked with his cousin Maurice Gibson, also a JSU grad and fellow Sonic Boom snare drummer, to coordinate with current Jackson State Director of Bands Dr. Roderick Little in assembling an ensemble of alumni from the classes of 2022 and 2023. According to Maurice Gibson, some potential participants were initially skeptical. Quote, they were thinking it was a scam. When they hear Drake and J. Cole, all expenses paid plus compensation, they're like, who's this guy calling me? I don't know him. Some alumni called Dr. Little to verify that it was all true. After the band was assembled, members were required to sign non-disclosure agreements before the tour opened to ensure nothing was leaked. The Sonic Boom alumni band is currently in the middle of an 18-city tour, which will last through mid-April. Dateline Stores, Connecticut. The University of Connecticut band program is launching a new project, its inaugural pep band showcase series. The plan appears to be that UConn will send its pep band to venues across the state of Connecticut to perform free concerts and to communicate in person with community members, UConn marching band alumni, UConn fans, and students. The first concert will be hosted by Platt High School in Meriden, Connecticut on Saturday evening, April 20th at 7 p.m. The performance and ensuing ones will be open to the public. If you'd like more information, I've included a link to the Facebook post that UConn's band director, Justin McManus, published in mid-February in this episode's show notes. And that's news and notes from the band world for this week. If you have a news item you think should be included in this segment, send me a link via email to heybandwagon at yahoo.com. Meet you on the other side of this quick break. Okay, let's pick it up at the second strain. (laughs) 
In this week's Second Strain, I'm back with another dramatic reading of one of my ancient blog posts, and it still somehow has stayed topical. The topic is a gentleman who was a color guard instructor of some kind of lofty reputation. He led indoor guards up and down the eastern seaboard and was the guard instructor at Temple University and the University of Delaware, which is where I got to meet him. As personalities go, let's just say that his would contribute to an interview for the ages if I were to sneak it into the bandwagon podcast. If you haven't guessed who he is yet, well, either all will become clear or you'll have been introduced to a truly remarkable soul. Here's my blog post from March of 2016. The color guard guy and the arranger were sitting at the bar in the Westchester Holiday Inn the night before Drum Major Academy got going. The conversation wound around to designing field shows. The color guard guy looked over at the arranger and said, Really, the way you write makes my job so much easier. It might have been the first time the arranger had known for sure that the color guard guy thought he was actually okay. The arranger accepted the compliment but raised his eyebrows a bit. He hadn't done anything consciously while writing to cause life to be easier for the color guard guy. The arranger was, however, relieved because he had seen what it could be like when the color guard guy didn't think you were okay. He could be, um, lacerative. The arranger is pleased to report, though, that since then he has paid much more attention to the visual elements of marching shows. He hopes the color guard guy has noticed, although he suspects that the color guard guy has his hands full dealing with the guard that belongs to the pride of the great beyond. It's been exactly seven years, I wrote in 2016, which feels like both forever ago and just yesterday. Curious how that is. Miss you, Donnie. Donnie Janess passed away on March 21, 2009, at the age of 46. It will be 15 years ago this Friday. I know a lot of people who still mourn the passing, but who still smile when we revive a memory involving him. If you've got a Donnie Janess memory you want to share, please do. I'll tell you how at the end of the episode. All right, let's grab another short break and get hydrated. On the other side of the break, I've got a conversation for you that I think you'll enjoy. Hope you'll stick around. Okay, let's modulate and get into the trio section. This week in the trio section, I'm joined by a teacher and musician by day, a dad and husband by morning and night, a voiceover artist by any other time you can possibly find. That's what it says on his LinkedIn page. We first crossed paths thanks to the George Parks Drum Major Academy, and more than once, he and I have jointly populated the UMass Alumni Drum Major line at Homecoming Post Game. Salute. Please help me welcome to the podcast, James Shetler. Hi, James. Thanks, Rob. How are you doing? I am well, and I am grateful that you agreed to come and do this. It's definitely my pleasure to do this. As we know, a tradition is anything you do three times in a row. So before we get into the thick of a conversation, let me get your answers to these questions three, except there are four of them, never mind. Uh, All right. Lightning round band questions so people can get a sense of who they're listening to. First up, what's your primary instrument? My primary instrument is the trumpet. I marched for three years as a trumpet player in the UMass band and uh, was a drum major for two. Which gets into my third question. So here's my second one. What's your current band-related role? Uh, My current band-related role, I am the uh, middle school band teacher and general music teacher at Groton Dunstable Regional Middle School in Groton, Massachusetts. And so that third question was going to be, and there might be a more effusive answer to this, what bands have you been active with in your life, either playing or whatever? So, you know, I, I, I grew up in Plymouth, Massachusetts. I was in the uh, combined Plymouth North and South high school bands. Um, I was uh, at UMass for uh, five years as an undergrad. Uh, like I said, I marched a trumpet for three and drum major for two. And then I had the very fortunate uh, opportunity to go, to go back uh, as a grad TA and was, uh, was a TA with the UMass band for uh, those couple of years that I was there for my master's degree. And kind of the, the relationship with UMass has kind of continued. You know, Dr. Anderson out there has uh, reached out to me a couple years ago and asked if I wanted to be the PA announcer for the band. So uh, this past fall was my second year uh, doing that. So uh, that relationship has kind of been constant for the last almost 20 years. <laughs> How did you get started playing trumpet? Um, I started playing trumpet in the fifth grade. I wanted to play trumpet in the fourth grade. I still remember going to, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have a lot of resources to rent an instrument. So we borrowed one from a family friend and I can still remember going to pick it up and being so excited 
took it out of the case when we got home and was trying to play it and and showing my parents that I could make a sound on the instrument. You know, I went I was upstairs for a while in our house and I can still remember going down and say, look, look what I was able, able to figure out. And that was all, you know, before the first lesson, every music teacher tells their students, don't do that. Don't do that. But I did it anyway. And uh, it was uh, there was a connection there at, at first play. I don't do a lot of playing nowadays, but, you know, there's still something about picking up my trumpet and being able to play it for my students or for church or whatever uh, that is is special, more so than any other instrument. So your current role puts you in as a middle school band director, and I would love to dig into that a little bit, partly because you've been a bunch of places. See, I did my homework, and I went and looked you up. So what kind of origin story have you got? Well, you know, it's it's been a long uh, kind of long and winding road, as they say. My first year teaching was in Wareham, Massachusetts, uh, fresh out of school. First year teacher, I was doing everything. I was doing band and chorus and music theory, and uh, I had a guitar class that I needed to teach. Uh, that was the second semester, and I kept putting off figuring out how to play the guitar because up, up to that point, there was no guitar tech class, and there was no exposure to any kind of gu- anything guitar in the UMass music ed curriculum. I think I think that has changed since uh, since then. But, uh, you know, I had to figure out, okay, how do I teach this instrument when most of the kids that are coming into my class have played it already and they know more than I do? You know, how do I make it interesting for them? How do I trick them into thinking that I know more than I do? I hear you. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we made it made it work. But uh, I was there. I was in Wareham for three years before I went back to grad school for my master's degree in conducting. Uh, I had the opportunity while I went back to UMass to work with some great faculty there, Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. Westgate, Dr. Anderson. And then I taught middle school band in Everett, Massachusetts. I was one of four itinerant music teachers, uh, band teachers. We were at a different school every day throughout the week. And we did a pullout lesson program, the four of us did. So Everett's budget situation is never certain because of the you know high levels of poverty and the high level of state aid that they receive. Uh, so that position ended up being cut at the end of my first year there. Uh, but I was fortunate to uh, apply for and interview for the job at Wachusett Regional uh, High School in Holden, Massachusetts, just outside of Worcester. Uh, I took over for the uh, the late, great Miriam Jensen, who you know, was retiring. She was on the interview committee, and you could tell right away that she was, you know, she was a special one. You know, it was a follow, following the legend kind of situation. And I've, you know, been I've been fortunate to be around people who have handled that kind of a situation well, have gone into a situation where they follow the legend and handled it really well. And I've seen people that don't handle it well. Yeah. I told some of the students, the, the student leaders, the first time I met them, I'm like, look, I'm not coming in here to change everything right away. I want you to be comfortable. I want to learn this. I want to figure it out. And, you know, they were very receptive, very open. They made me feel really welcome. Uh, my students did in my first year there. I was there for three years. My my contract at Wachusett was not renewed after, at the end of my third year. I didn't have professional status yet. And of course, in that situation, they can give you the boot for any reason whatsoever. They don't have to tell you anything. Or no reason. Or no reason. That's right. So that was, that was a surprise. It was a shock. I was able to kind of bounce back a little bit, but it, it caused some issues that you know, we can chat about a little bit later on. Hmm. Uh, But since then, uh, I've kind of bounced around between different jobs because of COVID related issues and budget related issues. I taught at uh, Lemonster for a year. I taught at the in the Narragansett schools out in uh, Templeton is like almost Western Mass. And then uh, I landed from there in um, at Nadnock Regional High School in uh, Swansea, New Hampshire for half a year before I took a job in Nashua and now I'm in Groton. So uh, a lot of different places over the years, uh, and I've learned a lot about myself and about music and teaching through all of that time. Now, there are music educators whose tour is created by being somewhere and then looking to the next place and heading there and then looking ahead career-wise to the next place and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I remember the fine arts department head in the district where I taught having a conversation with me. And I don't know how we got around to this exactly because I really wasn't looking. To, I was only there a couple of years. I wasn't looking to go anywhere. But the conversation included him saying a healthy school district supports its people even when they're looking to head to the next big thing. 
Mm. Um, and I, I always kind of took that with me, and I was able to uh, experience. I, I was able to experience that myself, and also see examples of when districts were not so much supporting friends of mine as they went places. That relates to sort of the, almost the stereotypical. I'm starting out; it's a first job, and I will look for the next job after I've been at this one for a few years and build up something to be able to show somebody, and then move to the next thing and move to the next thing. Um, your tour was kicked into motion at various times by things that were out of your control. That's right. Especially in these last, maybe, what year is it? 2024. Especially in these last five years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you had the, the contract situation in Wachusett. Uh, you had the the budget situation at, at and my the end of my time in Lemonster. They cut, as I recall, in the neighborhood of like 200 positions across the district. They cut that year. It was It was a bloodbath. You know, there were protests outside of the city hall, and I, I still don't know. And that was 2000, 2019, 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. And I still don't know if they're back to the same levels of staffing that they had been before that. The, the Narragansett position was advertised as part time, and I applied for it because it was getting late in the summer and I didn't have a job yet. Uh, you know, I interviewed for it and there was a, a couple of UMass people there. I guess their president of their music boosters was a big UMass fan. Her daughter has since gone to UMass and she's fantastic. But, you know, I knew because of that UMass connection, there was kind of a, a good chance at that one. But I remember talking to the principal and saying, you know, look, is there a way that we can make this full time? Because I'm, I'm traveling for all this way and it's, it's, it's not worth my while to do a 0.6 or a 0.7 position and travel an hour each way for full-time gas money yeah and to their credit they were able to bump it up to full-time for me for that year and but i think you know it was never really a a guarantee that it was going to last beyond that because they they i'm almost sure almost positive they used covid funds to kind of help fund that role so you know with that in mind it's like well they run out <laughs> Yeah, so at, at the end of Narragansett, I, I left and was like, I'm going to find something closer to home and ended up at uh, Monadnock Regional High School in Swansea, New Hampshire, which is not closer to home. Still about the same, it's the same direction, uh, so going west from where I live, still about an hour, you know, one way. And uh, I was there for half a year. I was there for a semester before I needed to step down from that position because of issues related to anxiety and depression that that had come up that were really coming to a head in that in that role um, and caused by a lot of kind of the circumstances in that role. It sounds as if none of those circumstances were circumstances that were within your control. So yeah. in some sense, one could look at it and say, well, this sort of thing happens. It's not like they fired me for cause. It's not like they thought I was doing a bad job. It was just it's questions of money or it's questions of budget even outside the COVID world. And then it's questions of money that's not going to be there forever. And all these kind of reasons or rationalizations that in theory – outside of your head, we outside in the outside world could say, well, you know, you can – it's a bummer, but you can handle that kind of thing. Yeah. And yet it does not matter. Yeah. In a lot of ways, you're right. It doesn't matter because like you said, in in the space outside of my head, it's like you said, it's one of those things where, okay, you know, there's not, not much you can do about that, but it's not the end of the world. But when it starts to happen – twice, three times, four times, you know, then it's like, okay, what's, what's the matter with me? What am I doing right. that it is, is causing this? Because this is starting to become a pattern. That has been one of the biggest kind of biggest things to wrestle with, especially over these last few years. It is easy to imagine those circumstances piling up and becoming that pattern. And inevitably, it seems to me, a person who is not a screaming egotist, who is not psychologically in a position to think that they are the best thing since sliced bread, you know, a normal person, a decently well-adjusted person who is empathetic to the world and thinking about things outside their own head is going to look at that situation and begin to turn inward and think, okay, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all of those feelings, plus a lot more, really came to a head in my time at Monadnock. And 
this is so this is a little bit of a, a side story but i think it's it's important and it relates to my time at Monadnock and Drum Major Academy, but it's uh, it's an important one, I think, to to share. The students gave me a hard time at Monadnock. They had really loved the guy before me, and they wanted it to be what it was when he was there. Point is that they were not good to me. And uh, the reason that I feel like I can say that is because some of them have reached out to me since then and have recognized that. Okay. And have made that you know, made that statement to me and actually apologized. Okay. Um, and the re- and again, the reason that I say it, bring this up is because, and tie it back to drum major Academy, which is kind of been the, the central theme in, you know, us knowing each other <laughs> for <laughs> the last, however long, a couple of those kids went to drum major Academy and there was a session on one of the, I think it was the second to last night and Heidi Sarver gave that list of options, things that you can do <laughs> if you don't like it. Yeah. And after that session, and I'm going to get emotional thinking about it right now. But after that session, two of those kids that, came, that, that gave me such a hard time came up to me in tears. Mm. Oh, they're at the session. They were at the session. Oh. And they were students at Drum Major Academy, and they, they just, it just clicked for them. Yeah. They'd come in for registration, and I was kind of standing there, and they're like, oh, he's here. Is this going to be awkward? Because I had resigned from the job six months prior, and we hadn't seen or talked to each other since then. But that night, for whatever, you know, that whatever, whatever it was about that and the, the content of that presentation really just resonated with them and clicked with them. And they came up to me, both of them in tears, apologized to me after that session. And it showed me that underneath the kind of the hard exterior that they were trying to present, they just they were just band kids. They just wanted to, to be in band. They just had an idea of what it should should be like. Mm-hmm. And they didn't, they weren't, you know, understanding that there's a give and take yeah. between the teacher and the, and the students and they got it. They got it that night. And I, I will never forget that. I was in a pretty good place that summer after I had left Manadnock. I had had about six months to just kind of stop and breathe mm-hmm. and figure some things out. Uh, that was when I started a lot of my voiceover stuff and was really looking into options outside of teaching Mm -hmm. because it had just worn me down especially these those last few years where you know we start to kind of start to look inward and it's okay what's the matter with me am i just not good at this is this just something that i should be you know should just put aside and make music my hobby instead of my job so i took another crack at it uh in nashua as an elementary school teacher this time completely outside of the realm of my comfort zone. Yeah. You know, and I, and I knew that I knew that going into it, but it was very much reinforced to me within those first few weeks of that elementary school position that I am not an elementary school teacher, but I had to, I had to do it because I have two kids. I have a house. We have, we have lots of debt, you know, that we have to pay the bill. We have to pay the bills. So I had, you know, I had to, I had to do it. But that year was not not a great one for me personally either because of all, of you know, very anxiety inducing and mm-hmm. my depression level and things like that just kind of skyrocketed through that. I think for teaching in general, teaching is a very high stress and high anxiety job to begin with, to begin with. And if you're not if you're not in a, in a good place personally and then you're not in a, in a good fit for you professionally, it's just going to beat you down and beat you down. And, you know, it's not, it's not that the people there want that to happen. It's just, it just does because that's, that's the nature of it. It has um, a chance to be an occupational hazard. Yes, absolutely. It does. And I, I have been fortunate um, over these last, especially the last say year or so to have been meeting with someone to work on that, hmm. uh, to get help for, you know, these issues that, that have popped up, these anxiety and depression issues that have popped up as a result of, my professional career. And I will say that once we found the right combination of, you know, therapy and medication, Mm. it was like a switch flipped. And I was able to just really understand why I would, why things were happening. They were the way that they were and how I could help, how I could help myself. I knew it wasn't going to be a a short process. It was going to take a long time, but I, I needed to make sure that I was the best that I could be for my family first and foremost, and then secondarily, my, my students. 
for the record, I am willing to say, I speak from experience in saying that accessing therapy is not a sign of weakness. No, no. And that's, that's the heart. That's a hurdle that I think a lot of people have to get over. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had to get over that, but I, at some point I realized this needs to happen. Like I need to do something about this. Hearing that the kids from Monadnock figured it out mm -hmm. strikes me as maybe the best thing to take out of that, partly because it made you feel like, okay, things were awkward, but we're going to get, we're going to push through this and they understand a little bit more than they did. And they, they have a wider perspective. But as we understand, the brain doesn't fully form until you're 25 years old. Mm -hmm. On top of which, the life experience is not there yet. In any case, no matter how great and, and and I mean, both of us in our jobs and at DMA, we've met some terrific high school kids who are probably on the upper end of the spectrum between will never grow up and have already grown up. Yeah. Yep. And to get that response, I got a warm fuzzy out of that one because I thought yeah. that's that was hard for them, and they figured it out. Ah. Yep. And I've come to learn since then that one of those students not only went back to DMA, but is also applying to UMass Amherst for their music education program. And there's a chance they will hear your voice over the PA system yeah. at football games <laughs> and, they will, and they will smile. Yes. That's a happy, not quite ending, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. With teaching, it's 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 so hard, especially when you're teaching middle school and elementary school, because you will never know the true impact that you have on that middle school kid or that elementary school kid mm -hmm. as their teacher. Mm -hmm. Because years from now, they'll think back to music class in middle school or band class in middle school and say, that was an important thing. I, I'm glad that we had ba that band class in middle school because I liked, I really loved doing that. But you'll never know as students' lives keep going, you know, they move on and they do their thing and you, you might never hear from, again, from them again. And, you know, you have to kind of make peace with that as a teacher, not necessarily seeing the end result. Yeah. And, and wondering what the thought process is because you don't know. And there's a, as an egotist, you assume that they're looking back and thinking, oh, Shetler was great. But as a normally adjusted person, you look back and say, God, I hope they thought I was okay. Yeah. And the hell of it is you don't know. Right. And like I said, you know, as a, as a teacher, you have to make peace with that. Every now and again, you get those that, that reach out and say, hey, I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah. I, you know, have been fortunate to have that experience a few times. And what so. they don't realize is it's the same as when I used to jump in a car with a couple of my friends when I was in high school and we'd go back down to the junior high because that's what it was at the time. And we would go visit our favorite English teacher and he would be off the wall, over the moon, thrilled to see us. And we didn't understand because we were excited to go back and see him. And when I got into the teaching thing and I had been there long enough to be in the same place and have former students come back and, and I'm, I'm doing work in my office after school and there's a knock at the door and there's Steve or Jesse or Julie. And I would be all thrilled and they wouldn't understand. They didn't grasp that one kid coming back to visit, the effect of it is exponential. Yes, absolutely. I'm thinking a little bit of the anxiety issue because as you say, teachers have anxiety if they're worth their salt as a teacher because mm -hmm. we're the kind of people that if 98% of things go right, we're obsessed about the 2% that didn't. But it's more than just the Sunday scaries. Yes. Know? And not, not to downplay that because beyond experiencing that myself during my teaching time, I read my Facebook feed on a Sunday afternoon and I see plenty of posts that make friends of mine who are teachers sound like soldiers stealing themselves to go back into combat. Right. And that was right. before COVID. And that was before uh, this time of teachers seemingly being easy targets for disrespect thanks to uh, politicians and people and and super PACs who have right. this need to dump on public education. And other than that, I have no opinion. But <laughs> <laughs> And it's probably another topic for another podcast yes. entirely. Yes, absolutely. But again, you could easily, you could say in a rationalization sort of sense, all teachers go through this at some level. And that doesn't set me apart. And that doesn't make me any different. I should just suck it up and deal. But 
I wonder how many teachers are in that place and maybe hear either this conversation or a conversation like it and say, you know, maybe it might not be a bad idea to go talk to somebody about this. That's the hurdle, you know. I I think you're right. You're you're absolutely right. I think that people do uh, that. Almost everybody experiences it to some level, but recognizing that beyond a certain point, it's not a healthy thing. Recognizing that and then recognizing the importance of getting help is super important. And I speak from experience in that way. For me, it got pretty bad. I was diagnosed with a panic disorder. Mm. Uh, and at times it felt like I couldn't go a day without crippling panic attacks. And it, it came to a head at, at my time in Monadnock. I used all my sick time in less than a semester mm. at, when I was at Monadnock because of that. Because I would be driving to school and in driving to school, I would have a panic attack in behind the wheel. My, my mind starts going and I would have a panic attack. I, there were so many times when I had to find a place to pull over and just let it play out. And for me personally, I know people, it manifests for people in different ways, but for me personally, it, it happens and it's like I get hit in the chest and then I'm done for the rest of the day. I can't, I can't function. And so, you know, there were so many times when that happened, when I taught at Monadnock, I had to call the principal and say, look, this is what's going on. And I will say this, as soon as I got out of there, it stopped. And then almost as soon as I started in Nashua, it started again. We have data now. Yes. Mm. Yes. It is and has always been work related. I can remember feelings of anxiety, you know, and now that I know about it and know what it is, I recognize it. And I, those, I've had these feelings since I taught in Wareham. Okay. Um, and of course, one of the first things that happened when I taught in Wareham was Mr. Parks passed away. Oh, you know, right. that was three weeks in, three oh. weeks into the school year in my very first teaching job. And all of a sudden, the guy whose recommendation got me the job is gone. And that, I think, in a lot of ways, created and set off a lot of a lot of things hmm. for those those years. It was never really that bad in Wareham, but it was it was always manageable. But then when at the end of my time at Wachusett, once that contract situation happened and they didn't renew me, you know, after all of that, that and never and never to this day and to this day i don't know why i and i would never will but not that not knowing was just something that set 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 me down kind of a spiral over the next few years really in terms of my anxiety and really made it hard to do my job hmm. but i don't and i don't i i never never once in my probably 2 years of really being close to the edge of leaving the teaching profession i was going to ask if you had thought about that as a, just just to pull the ripcord and go yeah it really started at at monadnock and into my time at nashua especially because i had a i had basically a seven or eight month break in between teaching jobs where i had to kind of figure out what's the next step toward the end of my time at nashua i knew that i knew that i wasn't going to go back there one way or the other whether or not they renewed my contract or not and they they ended up not but i didn't i didn't care can't decide whether that's a blessing or a problem. Right, exactly. Right. I mean, and, you know, when I told Mo Mo Molly, my wife, when I told her that, and, you know, there, we both had the same kind of reaction. It was just like, okay, what's next? You know, because I, I needed to get out of there. And, and she recognized that and I recognized it. So I saw a job pop up toward the end of my time in, in Nashua. And it was the only job that I ended up applying for. And it was the job that I'm in now. And cliche as it is to say, when one door opens something about doors and windows but uh. <laughs> right right exactly so i will say that this year has been a complete breath of fresh air a complete 180 from mm. a year a calendar year ago even it's all about finding that right fit and this job is that right fit for me right now thank you and good night yeah right <laughs> yeah you know with all of the with all of the long history now of of anxiety issues and the panic disorder and everything like that that has never once truly been an issue this year mm. and it's so much about finding the right fit and finding the right students and finding the right colleagues i feel like for a long time in most of my teaching gigs and a lot of times this was you know, this was when I was teaching with other music teachers, you know, that we were on, we were on a team. A lot of times in my 
in my time as a music teacher, I've felt alone. Um, you know, I remember my my student teaching advisor, the person I student taught with at Frontier Regional, told me once, teaching music is a lonely job. I don't think that really set in for quite a long time. Hmm. That that it, you know, because there were times when I would be on a team of four music teachers and I would feel like I was by myself because mm. that nobody that nobody would get it if I tried to say something. And then when I did a few year a few weeks later, I got a message from the principal saying he wanted to talk about the future of my position at the school. <sighs> so, you know, it's 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 really it's it's been a long road, but I've I have found I feel like I found the right fit. And I'm hoping beyond hope that this will be where I'm just at, you know, and that's been the goal all along is just like, I want to find that place where I can just be, especially as a dad with two little, two little kids. And, you know, I want to be consistent for them. I want them to, to have daddy at his best. So, and I think that all of these things kind of combine to create, you know, the best version of me that I can be. And that's what I strive for. And, if I'm not in the right position, the right job, I'm going to have a really significant challenge in trying to make sure that I'm the best version of me that I can be. I'm hoping that what I'm hearing is what is so, is that it's been the discovery that it's not the profession, it's the situation. That's been a big thing this year and a big realization. So before we finish up, let me hit you with some slightly less strictly resume-based lightning round band questions here. What's one of your favorite pieces of band music that you've played, either outdoors or indoors? One of the fav my favorite and most memorable experiences playing a band piece was playing with a UMass Wind Ensemble. We played the Mislanka's Seventh Symphony. Mm. And still to this day, I've never had an experience quite like that. And I, I love David Mislanka's music in a large part because of those symphonies that he wrote, the big ones. I did a piece, and we'll talk about this at a later date, but <laughs> I did a piece with the All Cape Honor Band called Illumination by David Meslanka. And that those those experiences that his music has provided is, have been like have been awesome. Okay, then. What's a piece of band music that you haven't played but you would like to? I didn't play it, but I did the narration for it of Sailors and Whales by Macbeth. Um, I did the narration for that, and I, I, I helped in the the UMass symphony bands rehearsal process, especially that I did because I have, I have a little bit of a choral background. Mm -hmm. um, I did the, uh, we did some choral rehearsal basically for the, the third movement where the band has to sing. And I think to this day, that's one of the best recordings mm -hmm. of that third <laughs> movement that I have heard. Thank you very much. I've not played it, but I would like, I would love to play it, but I, I've, I've been around it enough to know that I would like to play it. Is there a band that you'd love to perform with that you haven't, either because you aren't the right age or aren't in the right place or don't live in the right century? Yeah, I, had, I never had the experience of marching drum corps, mainly because I didn't know what it was until I got to college. Kind of like Drum Major Academy, I didn't know what DMA was until I auditioned for Drum Major my freshman year of college. Didn't have that spark that some people did, but you know, now that I'm, now that I'm a little older, I wish I could have had that experience, at least for like for a year just to say that I did it. And then I could talk, at least have honest conversations with people who other people who are interested in it and talk about whether or not they should do it. You know, what well, I'm thinking, you know, future students. Well, if we're talking specific, if we're talking, talking specific drum corps, star of Indiana, 1991 would have been probably the one that I would like to love to be involved with. Like the finale for that star of Indiana 91 show is still one of the most mind blowing things I've ever seen. And the stories that they tell about how it was created just make it all, just elevate it all the more. Tell me one of your favorite band stories. Oh, that's so hard. I remember having to drive, and this is just the situation itself was comical, having to drive the scissor lift back from band day where we did the band day rehearsal behind the UMass stadium over to the practice fields. Nick Morrison and I were in full drum major uniform driving this thing on the road at whatever its top speed was two maybe miles per hour that story that this is and the, the other the story that goes along with that is not my story but there was a time when uh there was one other time similar i think maybe the same year that the uh couple of the drum majors got pulled over in the scissor lift 
uh, moving it from the practice field to the stadium. And, you know, they, the police officer's like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, well, it's band day tomorrow. Well, the thousands of high school students will, you know, you know, they have to explain what band day is to this police officer who is like, you're driving a scissor lift on the road. <laughs> so many of my, my favorite memories in and around band have to do with, you know, the people that were in the band with me. And sometimes those are, you know, not specific band stories, but Another favorite memory of mine, and again, I didn't do this. This was band a my first senior year, but some of my very good friends did this. They bought yards and yards of burlap so that they could make a, their band costumes. They were, they were the sand people, the Tusken Raiders from Star Wars. So they took <laughs> painters' masks, cut little holes in them for their trumpet mouthpieces because all of them were trumpet players. And they had the little, you know, the little, what are they called? The cups that you have in the bathroom. Dixie cups? Yeah, like they had little Dixie cups that they cut the bottoms out of and stuck those into the, the mask <sighs> that they made. And those were the eyes. <laughs> but the problem was that some of them pointed different directions. So they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't see. <laughs> but the best part of it was at the end of the Bandoween rehearsal when Mr. Parks did the eyes with pride. He had the sand people, the Tuscan Raiders, do the eyes with pride by themselves. And the only thing that they did with all the commands was like that <laughs> for all of the for all of the commands. How are your feet? Err. At one point during that rehearsal also ran away with a scissor lift with not the scissor lift, but the with the long ranger. <laughs> and they ran away. Of course, if you're a Star Wars fan, you know that they ran away in single file to hide their numbers. That's right. <laughs> Oh, that's the Banthas. Never mind. Uh, it, it's it, <laughs> darn. It was almost funny. Um, <laughs> safe to say, only in band. That's right. That's right. And people only the only people that would get it are band people too. It feels like, which is quite honestly the whole point of this podcast thing. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> there we we invite other people to listen as they like, with the understanding that they're going to go. Was that? <laughs> Last question. I wonder if you have a favorite band life lesson or a bit of wisdom that you've found useful outside of band. Well, I mean, I have two or three things up on the wall behind where I stand uh, at the front of the classroom, but one of them is practice how you want to perform. That's applicable in anything. You know, if you want to do well in anything, you've got to practice that way. You've got to practice at a high level in order to perform at a high level. And then the other thing I try to make sure that I practice as well as I preach is to set yourself up for success. It's, it can be in small things, you know, if we're doing a breathing exercise at the beginning of class, setting yourself up for success looks like sitting with good posture, setting yourself up for success. If you want to perform at the student showcase would look different than that, but you have to think about what the steps are that you're, that are going to get you there. I think those couple of phrases kind of come back again and again in my teaching. And they're, they're ones that I try to, that I try to work into my own life as well. Well, I am grateful that you've been willing to come on here and set me up for success, <laughs> talking with me about uh, about some topics of conversation that, um, yeah, this might happen every so often, friends. Every so often, the topic of conversation might not necessarily be all funny stories and hilarious hijinks, but if if this session helped anybody, then great, I think. Absolutely. Is there some place where people who are interested in finding more about you can find more about you? Uh, I am easy to find on social media. You Google my name, James Shetler. You can find my social media pages. Um, I have uh, a link tree that uh, would link to my uh, my voiceover work, my narration work, as well as my kind of home base website that I that I use for my my voiceover. I'm easy to find on social media, and a uh, quick Google search will will bring up uh, bring up my my pages. We will get some stuff into the show notes for people who are curious and see if we can drive some numbers. <laughs> Perfect. That would be awesome. Massachusetts music educator and voice guy and some other stuff, too, I am sure, that we didn't get to this time around. James Shetler, thanks so much for your time and your wisdom today. You're very welcome, Rob. Thank you for having me. It's been This has been a lot of fun. Okay, one last break, and then we'll be back with a couple more little items. Thanks to you, my fine listener, for staying with me. Here comes the dogfight. fight. 
This week's dogfight is another band-related internet rabbit hole of the week. Where I offer up one of my online excursions that you may be inspired to pursue yourself. This week's rabbit hole of the week may sound at first like it's very band director oriented, and it certainly can be, in the spirit of giving any band member a look behind the scenes, a window into the mind of a band director, though I'd like to offer you a chance to visit the United States Marine Band's Digital Rehearsal Hall. I did promise you a trip down the Marine Band rabbit hole a couple of weeks ago, and I shall now deliver. This series of videos was started a couple of years ago. There are 11 episodes, each lasting 20 to 25 minutes on average. In each of them, the Marine Band is taken through a gentle rehearsal session on one particular piece of standard wind band repertoire by Colonel Jason Fettig, who was conductor of the President's Own until he stepped down this past December. Full disclosure, Colonel Fettig is a UMass Amherst graduate, and I'm very pleased about this. He's our guy! Sorry, back to the topic. Throughout, Colonel Fettig has the band play segments of a piece and then describes the slight adjustments he's about to suggest to the band, why he's hoping to make those adjustments, and what he hopes to hear when the adjustments are made not unlike any decent rehearsal you may have been in. Of course, this is a stellar wind ensemble, and before Fettig makes adjustments, you may wonder, so what do they need to fix? Sounded pretty good to me. I have a number of stories about attending rehearsals of great groups led by really good teachers with very sensitive ears, which I may regale you with in future episodes. Here, when I heard the Marine Band play, for example, Susan's Stars and Stripes Forever, I thought, that's their bread and butter. The only outfit that's more associated with that chart is the Boston Pops. They can probably play it in their sleep. But Fettig makes a couple of adjustments that are then played back, and I promise you will think that really is very different. The series repertoire includes Symphony in B-flat by Paul Hindemith, Stars and Stripes, Rayfon Williams' English Folk Song Suite, Three Movements from Percy Granger's Lincolnshire Posey, Carl Huss's Music for Prague 1968, The Grand Partita by Mozart, Richard Strauss's Serenade, Come Sunday by Omar Thomas, and my personal favorite of these, Variations on America by Charles Ives. There's a link to a playlist on the Marine Band's YouTube channel, which will give you access to all of these videos. Or you can run a YouTube search for Marine Band Digital Rehearsal Hall, and it'll pop right up. Whether you're using them for professional development, or just want to enjoy great performances and also great ensembles fine-tuning their craft, you'll like these videos, I think. Okay, one last pause to catch our breath, and then we'll wrap things up for the week. Thanks for continuing to listen. To wrap up this week, let's take the coda. For the coda this week, listener contributions. Listener contribution. One. That's all I got. I'll explain. It's not as bad as it sounds. I've gotten lots of listener feedback since I began bandwagon at the beginning of this month. Actually, I've gotten lots of communications from people ever since I dropped a hint that I was doing such a thing. And if you want to know the truth, that trailer that dropped on the 9th of January still holds up pretty well. But in the middle of January, I posted on my social media channels, all two of them. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. A question that I invited people to answer, either by email or by this nifty innovation that the folks at SpeakPipe have put online, where you can record little voicemails by merely clicking a link on the bandwagon website and it'll take you right to a recording pop-up screen, speaking of scientific advancement, and one person did that almost immediately. The question was, what made you decide to be in band? And here, in its 90-second entirety, is the answer I received. So, why did I decide to be in band? Well, from a very early age, music was always a part of my life. Uh, I came from a musical family, especially on my mom's side. When it came time to choose an instrument, um, it just seemed like it was the thing to do. And uh, uh, not only did I really enjoy it, but uh, it turns out that I was one of the better players. And then when I got into the high school, um, even though I was one of the younger members, I was still one of the better players, even uh, more so than some of the upperclassmen who was there. But really, what kept me there was I had found a place where I could be myself, where I felt the most like myself, um, doing the things that I really loved, surrounded by people who also enjoyed the same things, shared the same sense of humor, uh, the same interests, and uh, I guess I just kind of found my tribe. There may be some of you who recognize that voice. If you don't, don't worry, but that voice and my voice go way back. Now, I'm not sure whether he meant to do this, but that last bit, I guess I just kind of found my tribe. 
That's only what this podcast is all about. It's what it's meant to be. That's the point. This is a place for us to be a little tribe. Or hopefully a bigger and bigger tribe. It's good to have goals. I'm looking forward to expanding the tribe. That's Bandwagon for this week. Thanks, as always, for downloading and listening. Bandwagon was written, researched, and produced by your humble host. Musical interludes were produced by Hammerton Media from source material largely by John Philip Sousa. You can listen to more episodes at our website, heyband.podbean.com. Please give me feedback. Be polite, but let me know what you like, what you think might change. Tell me your best band story. Tell me a Donny Jeunesse story. Or suggest a topic for a future episode. Whatever you like. You can do that using our email address, heybandwagon at yahoo.com, or leave us a 90-second voice message by going to speakpipe.com slash heybandwagon. Be aware that we do reserve the right to include your message on the podcast unless you say otherwise. All those contact links and links to our news items, conversation topics, and this week's interview guest, James Shetler, can be found in our show notes. Please share the show on social media, and thank you for that. If you enjoyed this podcast, get someone else to listen as well. As it turns out, word of mouth is the best recruiting tool. And to keep up with us every week, subscribe to Bandwagon on the Podbean app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please give us a five-star review. It really helps other people to find the show. For now, take care, stay in touch, stay in tune, and we'll do all this again next week. I'm Rob Hammerton. Detail, Fallout 